grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We hear um, the, the last part of our gospel lesson today from Matthew chapter 11, starting at verse 7. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. We pray. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. In the name of Jesus Christ, dear fellow redeemed. What would happen to me, or what should happen to me, if I were to indulge in certain sins, if I were to pursue them, if I were to live in them, if I were to indulge in stealing or adultery or even consistently missing church. Well, if any of these things would take place, I would need the honesty of John the baptizer. John the honest, the brutally honest. I looked at my sermon from last year and I mentioned very clearly that John was guilty of brutal honesty, and rightly so. Well, if that were the case for me, I would not need John to tiptoe around me and tell you, well, if we just give him some time, he'll come around, just leave him alone, just be nice to him, and he'll be okay. In other words, we wouldn't need John to water down the concept of repentance or to revise sin according to the current cultural standards. If I'm living in any of these ways, I need John to do what John did best back then, so honestly, brutally honest, because I wouldn't want to be left where I am or where I am heading. We see John's honesty implied in Jesus' question in our text when he says, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? In other words, one who goes with the flow? Now John did not seek to satisfy the expectations of the people. He didn't seek to accommodate his message to the times or to the commonly accepted or popular beliefs of culture and society. He wasn't about to be pushed around either by people or by the standards of society at that time. John the Baptist was to answer to one and to one only. Our epistle lesson puts it this way for public ministers. It says, moreover, It is required of stewards, public ministers, that they be found faithful. Faithful. Faithful not to the ideas and the pressure of the commonly held beliefs of men, but faithful to the word of God alone. Jesus also said this of John in our text. What did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? 
In other words, did John come as one to look impressive or prestigious or important? The kind of person who would, people would say, wow, that guy is really something. He's really likable. He's famous or he's rich or he's good looking or popular. He's a star of some sort. He's got charisma that just exudes from him. Now, John didn't care about these things. He didn't care to try to impress people with some sort of outward show. Jesus describes John's mission in this way. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. So what does it mean to prepare the way before Christ? Well, it means, to use just one word, it means repentance. And there's two aspects of repentance that we always need to be reminded of. And here's uh, one way in which, one of the first way in which repentance is to be understood. We read this in the Gospels where John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, he said this, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So, this is the first aspect of repentance. And repentance means seeing and it means turning. Seeing what? Well, seeing sin as sin. Seeing sin as horrible, as offensive, not, not to one another, not to man, but horrible and offensive to God. As John says in another place, God's winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And so you can imagine that when John the Baptist was preaching like this, he probably did not have a real nice comforting voice. He probably wasn't smiling when he said it. He probably wasn't going up and giving people hugs. Uh, if you think about it, today if John were preaching, much of culture would probably demand that he be nicer, that he be more tolerant, and he drops some of this language, some of which would, today would be called hate speech. And so repentance, first of all, is seeing sin as sin and turning from it. It's not simply saying, oh, I made a mistake, I shouldn't have done this, this, this is kind of wrong, but it's, repentance in this sense, in the terms of contrition, means saying, I see my sin as offense against God, Lord, have mercy on me. That's the first part of repentance. You know, part of the problem today, of course, is a lot of sin is no longer seen as sin. And we have to be aware of that. What we have to do then, of course, is get out our Bible, read the Bible. We have to get out our catechism, read the Ten Commandments, read the explanation to the Ten Commandments, and say, oh, this is God's law. This is what is sin and what is not sin. Not what culture over here is telling me. We always have to be tuned into what does God say and realize that God speaks to us in his word and that what's out there in culture may be very, very contrary to what God says in his word. Because if we don't realize that, we're going to get caught up in society and culture and buy into what they say what is and what is sin. Again, repentance means, first of all, seeing sin as sin. And it means turning. 
turning away. But turning in repentance not only means turning away, but turning to something. And this is the second part of repentance. What do we turn to? Well, we turn to Christ. Before Christ began his ministry, John hammered away, was brutally honest about sin, preaching repentance and baptizing people for the forgiveness of sins. But as soon as Jesus appeared and began his ministry, Jesus started, or John started pointing, pointing to Jesus, saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He was saying that baptism for the forgiveness of your sins, this is the one in whom that forgiveness will be found. Your horrible, ugly, terrible sins. This is the one who will take them away. This is the one who will pay for them. This is the one who will bear them on the cross so that you will have this forgiveness that I am conveying to you. And so look not only at your sin, but believe in this Jesus. And so John was brutally honest about their sin. They had to see their sin as sin and turn from it. But he was also brutally honest about this one to turn to. About the comforting and free and unconditional total forgiveness because of this Lamb of God. <clears throat> As we'll hear in a couple of weeks, today in the city of David is born for you a king, a savior, who is Christ the Lord, the savior. This is the one we ultimately turn to and the only one we turn to in repentance. Now, why, why was John doing this? <clears throat> well, he was doing this, though he was obviously misunderstood by many both then and now. He was doing this for the souls of people, for their eternal well-being. Being brutally honest, preaching repentance, is not, as many people think, preaching hate speech or intolerance. But repentance, this call to repentance, to see sin as sin, from God's perspective, doesn't mean I don't care about you. It doesn't mean I am better than you. In fact, it means just the opposite. When we preach repentance in the biblical sense, we do say sin is sin in spite of what the culture might be saying. But we're also saying, here is the solution for what God calls sin. John the baptizer was saying, I care for your eternal well-being. And I want you to have what I also, a poor, miserable sinner, have. John was preaching for the care of souls. Now imagine if um, John did not do what he was called to do. Imagine if John had said something like, you know, God, this isn't going to be a popular message, so I'm going to change it because, well, first of all, I don't think I can handle the pressure. And besides, if I, if I water it down a little bit and come off like a, a nice Norwegian, maybe uh, I bet you I can eventually attract a lot of people to this message. I'm not going to take the chance, Lord, of turning people off by being too brutally honest. I think that if I don't hit their sins too hard and just let them kind of believe that sins aren't really sins, uh, maybe I can really help them in the long run. This is the world in which we live in today, of course. But listen to what the prophet 
or God records to the prophet Ezekiel. He says this, Son of man, he's talking to Ezekiel the prophet here, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel, so hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die, and you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways, that wicked person will die for their sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their ways, and they do not do so, they will die for their sins, though you yourself will be saved. Son of man, say to the Israelites, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down, and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? Again, John wanted them to see two things. He wanted them to see sin as sin and turn from it, repent, be contrite. And then to see the one who had come to take away their sins. Jesus, the Son of God, born on Christmas, but then who headed to the cross. And he had to do this because right next to every single person he preached to and right next to every single person here, including myself, are these three little whisperers. Satan, the world, and our own sinful nature whispering to us all the time. You're not that bad. Sin isn't really sin. Jesus Christ is not really who he said he was. He did not come to do what he said he did. And this is why it's so important to continue praying the Lord's Prayer, especially that sixth petition, lead us not into temptation, because as Luther says in his explanation of that sixth petition, we pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our own flesh may not deceive us or lead us into misbelief, despair, and other shameful sin and vice. And to be honest with you people, any pastor would admit that he'd like to back off, like to avoid teaching certain things, certain doctrines of the Bible, certain practices of the church because, you know, they're not all that popular. I like to teach them in such, such a way, I'm tempted to teach them in such a way that people would say, oh, that makes sense. I really like that. I'm not offended by that. But it's not always going to be possible. You know, we're never going to be popular in culture and society. But we aren't called to be popular. We're called to be faithful. To preserve and preach the word of God, including the law, in its truth and purity. And to properly administer the gospel in word and sacrament. In all its pure, free, unconditional, eternal comfort. So when we come up here today for the Lord's Supper, we know that the one we turn to, Christ, is there for our comfort. And when we gather on Christmas Eve, we know why this son was born, for our comfort. So may God continue to enable us always to have true repentance where we see sin as sin. Not cater to the world and water down sin, but see sin as sin, just as God has said. But then also always to turn to Christ, our comfort. Amen. Please rise.
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now, and shall be forevermore. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.